you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you, the organizers and the management for giving me the opportunity to talk to you in this forum. I hope you are all doing well. You just heard uh, the talk by Dr. Hasmuk Patel about the post-approval changes and the guidances and regulations related to post-approval changes. Once a drug is approved, it becomes post-approval. And all changes that are made during the, uh, during the process after approval is post-approval. Now, I am going to use the word life cycle in the place of post-approval. And I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you why I call it a life cycle. Now, defining a life cycle. So as long as the drug is being developed during the process, you go through discovery, uh, preclinical, then preclinical, phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. The drug is still uh, in the process of being made. And even though the clinical trials happen in patients, it's all still experimental stages. That is, it, it is like a baby still in the mother's tummy. Once the drug is approved by a regulatory agency, that is when you are legally allowed to market the drug to the public. Anything that is approved becomes post-approval. And all changes related to the approved product will be post-approval changes. When the drug goes through a life of in the post-approval stages over several years, when the patent is expires, patent expires, and the exclusivity expires, then it gives rise to many generic drug products. It's like having its own child. Then uh, the generics become mature and post-approval changes happen even in generic drugs. Now, what determines the life cycle? There are a lot of things that factors that go into life cycle of a product. Only after approval, the real activity of a drug can be observed. Its indication, how well it happen, works, the efficacy in patients, safety, long-term safety in patients. Then, in the quality perspective, you have manufacturability. When in the case of uh, new drugs, when they are being developed, the drugs are made in pilot scales or reasonably less, the smaller sizes compared to the larger sizes that fit into the market after approval. So the scale up and manufacturability of these kinds of drugs and its stability, its quality, maintaining the quality and how much of continuous improvement they can make to make economic um, prospects. You know, they bring the, 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 for ultimately, for a company, it is extremely important to make the business point of view, that's the economics, and how they can make sure that these drugs are produced in economical fashion and uh, make more money out of it. That's one of the things that's uh, it's important. The safety, efficacy, quality. The quality determines the safety and efficacy. And ultimately, for a business, it is uh, economics as well matters. I'll give you some examples here in this slide about some of the life cycle, uh, or the life of some of the products, how it turned out to be. These are interesting examples just for the sake of knowing. Terfenidine and fexofenadine. This is, terfenidine is a drug which has developed for allergies, a new molecular entity. Now, what they did is this drug was, um, uh, was marketed for almost 12 years in the 80s and early 90s. This drug is, was marketed as Seldane. The pro, they found that it had a lot of uh, side effects, especially arrhythmia and um, serious adverse events. When they found that out, they, the, during the drug was when it was being marketed, they found the actual reason for its efficacy for allergies were be, because of this carboxylic acid group, which is one of the metabolites of this particular drug. So this metabolite was later synthesized and they did a parallel clinical trial when it was still in the market. So they saw that they saw this efficacy was far greater. So they pulled this drug out of the market. And they, this is the one of the blockbuster drug for allergies, fexofenadine, and the toxicity was much lower compared to this one.
Now, there's another drug which had a lot of short lifetime of five years. This is one of the blockbuster drugs. It could have been a blockbuster drug, but it had, unfortunately, it had a, a serious adverse events. You can, you can see all these things. These are all publicly available in the database of uh, Wikipedia. You can go to Wikipedia and see that. Then uh, there's another drug, Tegaserod, I'm sorry, Tegaserod, which is a, was, was marketed as Zelnorm. Um, this was uh, for colitis, and um, this didn't last too long either. It had a lot of serious adverse events in patients, and so they had to pull it out of the market. Now, I gave you three different examples of three different indications. First one was uh, for allergies. The second one for, for uh, I think, arthritic pain. And the third, inflammation. And the third one was for uh, colitis. It, it, all, each one has a different indication, but still, you know, nevertheless, uh, if it becomes uh, a, a problem for the patient, a safety for the patient, then it goes away. This lifetime is very short. What happens in a life cycle? See, the real, the reality of a drug is really seen only after it is approved in, uh, by the regulatory agency, right? The real efficacy, long-term safety, and then the stability issues that are related to the formulation that, has, that was developed during the clinical trial, all these things come into play after approval. And there are a lot of things, changes that happen even during development, but there can be unintended consequences in the long term, which could not be seen when the drug was being developed. So we can see all those things in the life cycle, in the life of a product. And potentially uh, alternate dosage forms, if it's a tablet, it can become an injection, it can become a syrup, a oral syrup, it can become uh, many different forms that can, that can take place. Uh, in, the, in the life cycle. And challenges in maintaining high standards is very important during the life cycle. Now, during the life cycle, when a drug is approved, it may become a blockbuster. A lot of things can happen. It become a blockbuster. So the company makes a lot of money. So when it becomes a blockbuster, they can't keep up with the market, right? So they have to make a scale up. So they have to make, make sure that the quality is up to the mark. And they may have to come up with different strengths. Um, so sometimes it may have unintended adverse events not seen during the clinical trials. So they have to address those things and uh, in the labeling. And maybe with the drawn to serious adverse events, we saw three examples before, and may prove to be a more effective for, for something else than this indication. For example, I'll give you minoxidil. Minoxidil is one of those, uh, is a generic name, but minoxidil is, uh, was really developed for uh, hypertension, but it became a very good hair growth product because people who took the medication had less impact on the, um, the hypertension over growth of the hair. So it became a very cosmetic uh, product. It's sold over the counter now. Now, managing the approved drugs is very important. After approval, is a very crucial step for the companies to manage them and extend its lifetime. So you have to maintain, to make sure, they have to monitor the drug. So, so the entire thing in the post-approval is a phase four. Uh, it's almost like uh, that's being in the market, but they still, they have to observe all the data and collect them. And, uh, and that helps the company too. Managing the approved products is a, is a balance of best risk management. So understanding the past experiences, evaluating what is happening in the market, the present situation, and planning for a better future with all the lessons learned during this process. And changes are necessary to avoid pitfalls. There's a lot of changes that happen. So post-marketing changes are inevitable no matter what for multivarious reasons. Now why post op I, this is, I preempted this slide in my pre previous talk, the previous slide. So the optimization this happens during the post-marketing, production scale up, fine tuning the controls, making sure the company then, during the development of the drug, you know, a lot less attention is paid because they're not sure if it's going to be approved. So once it's approved, the confidence of the company grows and more money is put in or pumped into this product so that they can make more money out of it. 
the changes are global nowadays everything uh, becomes uh, a global a globalized economy uh, so different parts of the drug come from different parts of the world and so the changes that are made for uh, should have to maintain the quality uh, so at different levels right so it's the global changes may impact the product quality so we have to watch out those those changes have uh, an impact on the quality so that's why we have to follow certain guidances now quality changes are tied to the economics of the company that's why they are going around for finding the cheapest products uh, the cheapest uh, material from uh, different parts of the world and multiple changes at multiple levels for multiple reasons are the life cycle changes what are the different kinds of changes that you are going to see right one one of the important things is prior approval changes these prior approval changes have higher risk changes okay that means it will surely impact the quality of the product so you, the this means that means that the company cannot implement the product if, without approval of the agency now the review clock is 4 months there's a shorter time and if it is a change with respect to the labeling or a, a, for another indication efficacy then it's a 10 month clock or a 6 month clock depending upon what the change is how the priority of the change is then changes being effective 30 days is a moderate risk change high moderate risk change so moderately higher risk so, but it's a moderate risk so this is a review clock is 6 months so 30 days means 30 days gives the agency a uh, time to assess this application if the agency is satisfied okay you can go ahead and implement you may go ahead and implement it after the 30 days if you didn't hear from the agency and if if you got an acknowledgement letter saying yes it's filed as a cb 30 supplement you can go ahead and implement, implement the change and the review clock is 6 months then there is another change which changes being effective zero days that means you can submit the application to the agency and implement it simultaneously that's the legal definition of it now the review clock is again 6 months this is also we consider as a moderate risk but lower moderate risk and this moderate risk um, uh, changes are necessary for documenting uh, and making sure that we review them sometimes we are not happy if we are not happy with the cpv zero changes we think it's uh, it has to be raised to a higher risk we will call the company and let them know that it is a higher risk and it will be changed to pas or cbe 30 now there's another change is annual reportable changes which are low risk changes or no risk changes for example editorial changes are no risk changes no actually editorial changes do not have a risk on the quality of the product directly that's why they're called no risk or low risk and there are other uh, the stability extension of expiry is one other example i will give you examples for all these changes okay now prior approval changes the example some of the examples new formulation change including changes to excipients the labeling changes additional strengths primary container closure system changes comparability protocols you learned about comparability protocols in dr patel's talk before and manufacturing facility changes uh, to sites with no with no gmp trees available and now you will hear from rose who is following my talk will talk about the facilities and what are the risks associated with the facilities and what kind of changes uh, are, uh, you can implement or not implement then the stability protocol changes these are all high risk changes considered as high risk and they need to be supplement supplement they need to submitted as prior approval supplements now cbe 30 changes cbe 30 changes are some of the manufacturing facility changes again i i told you that rose will cover these you know there's a little bit of overlap here but this she will cover in detail uh, the manufacturing facility changes which has gmp history already available and if we are confident you can go ahead and make the change within 30 days after the 30 days um then the cb0 you can do within 30 days but cb30 after the 30 days change in testing facilities with uh, where gmp facilities history is available then manufacturing process changes 
analytical method changes, those are all moderate risk changes. Now, CB0 changes are examples are additional specification controls. So if you have an addition of a specification, so you need, we need to more document it. So you can submit it as a CB0 change. Method modifications, editorial changes, corrections, missing data, sub commitments, and sub depending upon the risk, changes that do not impact uh, uh, the step of quality, safety, and efficacy in any way can be zero, you know, CB zero of submissions. Annual reportable changes are some of the changes that you need to, uh, you could submit uh, in an annual report. For every drug that's approved on its, after the first anniversary, within a month, you need to submit an annual report. And that annual report should contain certain amount of information which you can look up the guidance on annual reportable uh, changes, what kind of report you need to uh, submit. In that, you can even extend the expiry dating period with an agreement with the agency during the NDA uh, approval process. And long-term stability data is required to extend the expiry dating in such cases. You can do that. That's one of the high-risk changes that you are allowed to do that. But some of the high-risk products, we don't let them do uh, extend the date unless you submit a supplement as a C PAS or a CBE 30. Now, Asmuk also talked about ICHQ 12, the guidance for uh, for life cycle management of uh, of approved drug products. Now, this is like the company has a blueprint of an approved product, what they are going to do over the period of its life. And uh, not necessarily the life, the life may be uh, over a period of the next five years. And they can come out with a plan and they, they can come with uh, to the agency and ask for what, they, what the expectations of the agency are for the specific changes they have, they're planning to make. And uh, those are established conditions and non-established conditions. Those, have a risk-based approach uh, to the changes. Now, this gives a regulatory flexibility to the company so that they know what to expect from the, com from the agency and the company uh, is also aware, plan, uh, also aware of what kind of planning they have to make for those kinds of changes. Now, this is always dealt by a case-by-case -case basis. Now, the objectives of this uh, ICHQ-12 uh, is to really give a regulatory frame, framework for the during the life of the product. And the company um, knows what the, to ex what the agency expects, and the agency knows what the company is expected to do, is expected to do, and what kind of supplements are going to come in for the submission for that particular product. If there is a problem market alert, they can tell the company to make changes accordingly. Innovation and continuous improvement is one of the reasons for this. Uh, it encourages innovation and continuous improvement for, uh, for a particular techno for technology application or uh, even optimization of the process, etc. Now, common changes in uh, after approval during life cycle are many. And some of them examples here are formulation, dosage forms, uh, introduction of a new strength, and uh, changes in testing facilities, changes in manufacturing facilities, changes in manufacturing process. All these kinds of common changes happen. These are not, not just limited to this, but there are a lot more happening. But I'm not going to spell out every different change, every little change that comes to us. They're just giving you an example here. Um, now, what I decided to do is to give you some study case studies. Now, these case studies are uh, embedded questions in it, and the que this, is, this will also serve as a CE question and answer session kind of thing. Okay, just to make you think, just to make you think, uh, based on what you learned, very little you learned here, and what what you can, uh, what kind of inference you can divide derive and what kind of decisions you can make based on these case studies, okay? Now let's read the first case study. I will read it out to you. An immediate release tablet um, drug product was approved five years ago, all right? Now the manufacturing process was a batch process. 
Now the applicant wants to change the process to an efficient continuous manufacturing process. What should they do? I'll give you a few seconds to think a little bit. What kind of a submission they have to file or what kind of a process they have to do? Let's go to the answer now. Okay, study one. This is a novel technology. So continuous manufacturing, continuous manufacturing has been used in the food uh, processing world for decades. Uh, it has been known in the food uh, food area for decades. But implementation in pharmaceuticals has always been, uh, I think, was shied away because there was always a problem that you know this may may not reach to the standards of the expectations from a regulatory agency's perspective. Now, the technologies have improved so much with the uh, onset of uh, higher capacity of uh, detectability of various analytical techniques. We are able to use these techniques in uh, the pharmaceutical world. So the best thing to do that, this is considered as an emerging technology. Now, the best thing to do to implement this is to come up with a package request a meeting with the agency submit send the package with relevant questions to ask so that you know what the expectations from the agency are and usually these emerging team technologies team will get involved and uh, we also encourage a pre-operational visit to the company to see uh, so that when the review when the submission is submitted when the supplement is submitted to the agency, the reviewer will have an idea of what to expect. In case study two, this question, okay, is uh, usually the, 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 for the first case, it's always the prior approval supplement, okay? Um, in the case of a, this particular case, a liquid sterile product in the polymeric primary container pressure system. The applicant wants to change the resin due to discontinuation of the currently used polymeric resin. What should the applicant do in terms of implementing the change? Okay, you have a polymeric resin container, no longer available for them to package in the product, in the, in the particular container closure system. So the new resin polymer is now being sought after. And what should the applicant do to implement the change? Let's look at the answer. So this would be what kind of filing? The change will involve a higher risk. So it's a prior approved supplement filing. Okay. Then the stability data of the product in the proposed resin is important because there's no history on that. We don't know what this resin is, what this resin will do, what kind of products it will leach out. So or what kind of reaction this particular product is going to have on this new resin. So the best thing is to make sure that you have the extractable data and leachable data for this particular product. The extractables are done in different kinds of, of solvents, highly polar to highly non-polar solvents, both organic and aqueous, high pH to low pH in aqueous, and make sure what the leachable data, what kind of extractables you can collect. And based on those extractables, you need to find out what kind of elements that leach into the drug product when it's stored in under stability conditions up to the um, expiry dating period. Now, based on the extractable, on the leachables, the pharmacology, toxicology needs to be evaluated and uh, the, this is very important because this may impact the safety of the patients. So if these leachables should be below the reporting threshold. Okay, study three. After approval of an extended release oral drug product, the applicant wants to change the analytical method without changing the specification. What kind of submission is required? Analytical method. So I've been, I never told you what analytical method, okay? So if you have a leeway to answer, the answer would be, it depends. That's a good answer, okay? Now it can be a PAS or a CBE30. 
invariably it's a PAS or a CBE that I'll tell you why. But if it's an extended release product and if it's an uh, extended release oral dosage form, then the dissolution can have a serious impact when the method is changed. So that will be a prior approval supplement. However, if it is, uh, say, LC, to if you're changing from HPLC to a UPLC, that can be submitted as a CB30 supplement. Or if you are changing the solvents in the HPLC for a better resolution, you can submit it as a CB30 supplement. Solvent or a buffer or, you know, conditions of chromatography, everything can be in the, under those, those kinds of changes can be a CB30. Case study four. An applicant submits a supplement for a change in the supplier of an active pharmaceutical ingredient. Now, reference is the brand new DMF, drug master file. If you don't know what drug master file is, I can explain this. I'll give you a very short definition of it. Drug master files are, are independent uh, owners of uh, suppliers of components of the drug product. So drug master files can be for drug substance or, or a drug product. Now, uh, any company can go and buy the drug substance directly and these are the, the drug master files will be allowed to be reviewed only on the authorization of the drug master file owner. And the agency uh, requires the, that to be requires to be reviewed and that DMF should be adequate. <clears throat> the drug master files, uh, if you don't know, I, I'm, I'm sure somewhere along the line, somebody must have uh, defined it to you, uh, either in the post-approval or pre-approval you know, discussions. So the manufacturing facility has been previously inspected for this, uh, the owner of the drug master file where the drug product is approved. Now, it has an acceptable GMP compliance. However, no changes in the process or impurities were reported. The specification is exactly as it was approved in the original NDA. What would be the filing category? Remember one, one caveat here, it, this is a brand new DMF. It's never been approved, never been reviewed. So and under such circumstances, it would be a prior approval supplement and you guessed it right. Okay, so this um, is a brand new DMF. It says reviewed efforts. So, so if the facility is in good standing, Prior approval inspection may not be required, but it may be required if that profile class was never, if that profile class was never reviewed, okay, or never uh, reviewed in the, uh, or inspected. You will learn more about it in Rose's talk. And let's go to case study five. In case study five, a prior approval supplement references DMFA for a new drug substance manufacturer. DMFA references DMFB, DMFB references DMFC. During the review, it was reviewed, determined uh, that uh, the facility used in the manufacture of the drug for our substance was recommended for approval and data provided DMFA and DMFB were adequate. And however, DMFC when reviewed is found, was found deficient. What would be the outcome of the review? What would the agency say? It is obviously it's a prior approval supplement. I gave you the answer. What would be the outcome of the review? DMFA, everything looks good. DMFC, all the data looks good. DMFB, all the data looks good. But DMFC is adequate. But remember, DMFC is referenced by DMFB. So the case study five, since the DMFC is referenced by DMFB, all DMFs A, B, and C will be inadequate. Okay. Hence, the entire application will receive a complete response letter. You know, if you, it's the chain reaction. So, because whatever you reference should be adequate for that one to be adequate as well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of one example on combination drug products. Uh, give you an example of pulmonary devices. The pulmonary devices are very complicated because if you have m many moving parts and uh, how you inhale uh, is very important. What is inhaled and how much of drug goes into the lungs 
is very, very important for the efficacy and the safety of the patient because many of these drugs are uh, emergency medication because you get to a asthma, asthma attack, they want to have the inhalation done immediately, especially for all butyrol kind of things. So you want to have it in hand and everything should work properly at that time. So the devices have to work good along with the drug delivery. That's very important. Okay? Now, in the case of pulmonary drug, I want to show you what are the issues that are very, very important. The dose delivered is important. The, when the dose, what is delivered, one of the other important aspects of it is the aerodynamic particle size distribution. It should be between two and five microns, two and five microns. If it's lower than two microns, it just comes out, doesn't go to the lung. If it's higher than five microns, it goes and stays in the throat. So the two and five microns is optimal for the lungs to be, be absorbed. And the plume geometry, I will show you an example. A small change can vary the plume geometry when they have the aerosol spray. And extractable, leachable information is very important. You don't want something that's uh, uh, which, which is a thing that's leaching, that's going into the lungs because lungs are extremely sensitive organs. And the human factor, how the device is used, how intuitive the device is, is very important. Now, the, giving you an example of a meter meter dose inhaler, uh, this is a liquid aerosol. Is the, the the particles of the drug active pharmaceutical ingredient is distributed or does into in the form of a suspension into the aerosol, and when you press the uh, device, the plume comes out. The, the drug is dispersed into the mouth to the, go into the lungs. So if you see the number of parts, so many parts, there are all, almost 20 parts in this, in this product, okay, in this device. And the product has two parts, that is uh, the aerosol and the, the active ingredient. With an example, when they change the aerosol from CFC, that's chlorofluorocarbon freon, to HFA, which is another kind of aerosol which has alcohol in it, so what happens? The plume geometry varies. So this appears to go deep, right? This seems to produce a better plume geometry compared to this. So there is a lot, a lot, lot of difference. Obviously, due to Montreal Protocol, CFC is no longer available. But I want to show you the difference. Uh, what very small changes can impact uh, the the uh, the dose delivered, the drug that is delivered to the patient in a large, uh, in a larger uh, way. Oh, in conclusion to my talk, life of a drug product starts only after its approval by the agency. Changes to drug product after approval are essential for multivarious reasons. I told you why they have to change, what, what are the kind of different kinds of changes, and why these changes are important, and the risk-based analysis of these changes, and how we review them. So you have to evaluate the risk on your own, and if the company sometimes may feel the risk is so low, but we, in the experience of what we do, everything is a case-by-case -case basis, and the risk may, we may think in a different way, and the risk may be higher. Maintaining the high quality throughout the life cycle of the product is very, very important. And the focus on the patient should be the ultimate goal. So whatever changes you make, would you uh, make sure that it is of high quality and make sure it is safe and efficacious in all the patients that are going to use it? Now, last but not the least, as I showed you, the patient, the big elephant is the quality. So you can look at different parts of a drug and different aspects of the drug. And however, when you look, make the small changes one in one end, it can have an impact on the other end. So you, you have to consider the elephant as a whole, drug as a whole, for impacting and establishing the quality throughout its life cycle. And thank you for your attention. Now I conclude.